On July the 6th, 1940 in Berlin, Adolf Hitler celebrated his victory in Europe. His army chief called him the greatest warlord in history. From Moscow, Hitler's collaborator, the Russian leader Joseph Stalin, had sent his congratulations. In London, the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was isolated. In Washington, the American President, Franklin Roosevelt, stood aloof. In the coming five years, everything in the relationship between these four men would change in ways that seemed unimaginable. While their nations fought a war of weapons, these four great warlords of the 20th century fought a war of the mind. What started as a European war has developed into a war for world domination. At the heart of this private war was a series of psychological duels in which they lied, schemed, charmed, flattered and deceived to win. What was curious was that these duels took place not between enemies, but between men who at the time were allies. Yet their behavior was egotistic, tempestuous, monstrous, and politically, despite the rosy glow in which some are seen today, always selfish. We shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they... The duels of the warlords decided the strategy for the greatest battles in history. They were also the epicenter of a seismic shift in world power. From the age of European empires to the age of two ideologically opposed superpowers, with devastating consequences for hundreds of millions of people. Ober Salzburg in southern Germany, one of the world's loveliest places. It was here, in August 1939, that Adolf Hitler was thinking the unthinkable. Hitler had set his heart on invading Poland, and his generals had told him he must attack before the autumn rains came. But Britain and France had said they would go to war for Poland. One thing stood in Hitler's way, the fear that Russia would also turn against him and propel him into a war on two fronts. This was the very thing imprinted in Hitler's mind as having helped to lose Germany the First World War 20 years before. There was only one way out, a pact with his greatest ideological enemy, Joseph Stalin. Hitler put out feelers to Moscow. Though he little realized it, he was instigating a mental duel with Stalin, which over the next two years would decide the destiny of the Second World War. Stalin was deeply suspicious of Hitler's approach. He spent hours reading Mein Kampf, written 15 years before underlining key passages, like Hitler's views of the Bolshevik leaders, men such as Stalin himself. Never forget that the rulers of present-day Russia are common blood-stained criminals, that they are the scum of humanity. But Stalin could see that Hitler was now desperate for a deal, and offering to send his foreign minister, Ribbentrop, to Moscow. Stalin decided he would go with Hitler. Hitler's propaganda chief, Joseph Goebbels, noted in his diary, 22nd of August, 1939. Non-aggression pact with Moscow perfect. Ribbentrop in Moscow on Wednesday. That is something. We're on top again. Now we can sleep more easily. On August the 23rd, Ribbentrop landed in Moscow. 
but Hitler needed one piece of reassurance. He sent his personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, to film Stalin's earlobes to see whether they were ingrown and Jewish or separate and Aryan. They were separate. Stalin passed Hitler's test. Shortly after midnight, on August the 24th, 1939, the Nazi-Soviet Pact was signed, and with it, a secret protocol under which Germany and Russia would carve Poland into two. Hitler phoned Ribbentrop. This will hit like a bombshell. But, as Goebbels noted, it was not strength, but fear of Stalin knifing him in the back that had forced Hitler into history's biggest U-turn. The Führer believes he's in the position of scrounging for favors, and beggars can't be choosers. In times of famine, the devil feeds on flies. In the Kremlin, Stalin proposed a toast. I know how much the German nation loves its Führer. I should therefore like to drink his health. But like Hitler, Stalin was also acting from fear that Hitler would attack him. That evening he told his inner circle, Of course, it's all a game to see who can fool whom. He thinks he's outsmarted me, but actually it's I who's tricked him. Stalin had found a bedfellow for whose cunning he had held a long and sneaking admiration. Back in 1934, Stalin had observed Hitler eliminate his rivals within the Nazi party in the so-called Night of the Long Knives. He remarked, Did you hear what happened in Germany? Some fellow that Hitler, splendid, that's a deed of some skill. Hitler had felt no such mutual admiration. In his early years in power, he was set on the dreams of Mein Kampf, an alliance with Britain's sea empire, while he expanded to the east and built his German land empire on the continent. Only when that plan had clearly failed did Hitler begin to see in Stalin someone he might do business with. Stalin was the first of the two to be a mass murderer. His terrors killed millions. He once compared his victims with the Boyar landowners massacred by Ivan the Terrible 400 years before. Who's going to remember all this riffraff in 10 or 20 years' time? No one. Who remembers the names now of the Boyars Ivan the Terrible got rid of? No one. A week before he invaded Poland, Hitler made an eerily similar remark to his generals. Genghis Khan had millions of men and women killed by his own will and with a gay heart. History sees him only as a great state builder. And who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? For both men, mass murder was just another weapon in the ideological struggle. The state, whether communist or Nazi, was supreme. Individuals were its disposable tools. They even extended this idea to their domestic lives. Hitler had secret mistresses, most notably Eva Braun. But in public, no woman could come between him and his nation. One of his secretaries recalled that he emphasized again and again. My lover is Germany. Stalin did marry, twice, and had children. But the suicide of his second wife, Nadia, in 1932, further brutalized him. Echoing Hitler, he told an associate, A true Bolshevik shouldn't and couldn't have a family because he should give himself wholly to the party. Stalin told his son, Vasily. 
I'm not Stalin. Stalin is Soviet power. Now, in August 1939, these two great ideologically opposed warlords were inextricably linked. Eight days after the signing of the pact, Hitler invaded Poland. Britain declared war. Winston Churchill rejoined the British cabinet. Stalin publicly supported his Nazi collaborator. He told the world, It is not Germany who has attacked England and France, but England and France who have attacked Germany. The enslavement of Poland further united the two extreme proponents of totalitarian violence. SS units killed 60,000 Jews and members of the Polish ruling class. It was Hitler's first experience of mass murder and profoundly influenced him. It showed him his followers would actually do it. Stalin's secret police, the NKVD, long versed in mass killing, would carry out similar massacres in the east of Poland. Among their victims were more than 20,000 Polish officers and political prisoners whose bodies would be discovered three years later. As their secret police mutilated Poland, the two dictators faced their destinies hand in hand. Over the next two years, in a mind war unparalleled in world history, they would both become gripped by a series of delusions that would lead them into colossal error and the bloodiest conflict there has ever been. Stalin had entered his pact with Hitler with open eyes. He never doubted he was supping with the devil, but he believed the pact would give the Soviet Union both protection and opportunity. Just a week after the Nazis invaded Poland, he told his inner circle, A war is on between two groups of capitalist countries. Hitler, without understanding it or desiring it, is shaking and undermining the capitalist system. We can maneuver, pit one side against the other to set them fighting with each other as fiercely as possible. Stalin was also eyeing up a further desirable outcome the chance to expand his communist empire. What would be the harm if, as a result of the rout of Poland, we were to extend the socialist system onto new territories and populations? For Hitler, the pact also opened the door to conquest. He could now turn all his energy and attention to planning the invasion of France. Joseph Goebbels noted Hitler's hopes for a long-term collaboration with Stalin. 1st of October, 1939. Conference with the Führer in private. He is convinced of Russia's loyalty. After all, Stalin is set to pocket a huge profit. But Stalin saw no such loyalty in Hitler. Mein Kampf was etched in his mind. Above all, Hitler's youthful ambitions to conquer Russian territory for the new German Reich. If we speak of territory in Europe today, we can primarily have in mind only Russia and her vassal border states. Because he calculated that Hitler might still one day turn on him, Stalin set out to build a line of buffer zones to protect himself against possible Nazi attack. He forced the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia and Latvia, to accept Russian garrisons. He told the Latvian delegation, There has been an unexpected turn, but one cannot rely upon it. We must be prepared in time. Others who were not prepared paid for it. The Germans might attack. Stalin also tried to bully Finland 
into giving him a swathe of territory as a further buffer. The Finns refused. Stalin invaded their country. It was a disaster. Within days, thousands of frozen Russian corpses littered the snow. Finally, the Finns were beaten, but not before killing 125,000 Russian soldiers. Stalin sent in his political commissars to shoot the Soviet commanders. But the real fault was his own. His terror had got rid of the Red Army's best officers. As Goebbels noted, the Red Army's incompetence offered Hitler yet more comfort. 15th of March, 1940. The Russians can never become dangerous for us. If Stalin shoots his own generals, we won't need to do it. So far, we've had nothing but advantages from our alliance with Russia. On May the 10th, 1940, Hitler, with his Eastern Front secured by Stalin, launched his Blitzkrieg to the West. The German army sliced through France, Belgium and Holland. The British were driven from the continent. For Hitler, it was a triumph. For Stalin, a disaster. Nikita Khrushchev, later Russia's prime minister, recalled Stalin's reaction to Hitler's lightning victories. I remember being with Stalin. He was extremely nervous. He was racing around, cursing like a cab driver. He cursed the French. He cursed the English. How could they allow Hitler to defeat them, to crush them? Stalin not only saw the superiority of the German army, he knew that the Germans sensed our weakness because of the war we had fought with Finland. On June the 17th, 1940, the French government sued for peace. The long-lasting and mutually destructive war of the capitalist and fascist states, which Stalin had so gleefully anticipated, was over in a trice. The next day, as Hitler celebrated in Munich with the Italian dictator Mussolini, Stalin, with gritted teeth, sent his congratulations on the Wehrmacht's splendid success. For Hitler, victory had lanced a boil. Germany's defeat in the First World War had been avenged. Now, for the first time in his political life, he wanted a rest from conquest, and reverting to his old instincts, peace with Britain. The Italian foreign minister, Count Galeazzo Ciano, was also in Munich and observed Hitler's state of mind. Hitler makes many reservations on the desirability of dismantling the British Empire, which he considers even today to be an important factor in world equilibrium. Hitler is now like the gambler who, having made a big win, would like to leave the table risking nothing more. But Stalin feared that Hitler, having won his victory in the West, might immediately be tempted by his long-held ambition of expanding to the east. Stalin now embarked on a hugely risky double strategy, going on a 10-day land grab to expand and protect his empire, while also trying not to provoke Hitler. He occupied the Baltic states and Bessarabia, the northern province of Romania, this was allowed under the Nazi-Soviet pact. But he also decided to invade another Romanian province, Bukovina. It was not assigned to Stalin under the pact. Hitler's chief of staff, General Franz Halder, noted Hitler's alarm in his diary. 
25th of June, 1940. The issue of Bukovina raised by Russia is new and goes beyond our agreements with the Russians. At precisely this moment, Stalin's duel with Hitler took a second unexpected twist. The Soviet leader received his first letter from Winston Churchill, who'd become British Prime Minister on the day Hitler launched his Blitzkrieg. It was an appeal to Stalin to beware of Hitler and come over to Britain's side. Stalin did not reply. Instead, to show Hitler his loyalty, he reported Churchill's approach to Berlin. Hitler now began to make his own interpretation of these two pieces of evidence. Stalin's rapacity in Romania and Churchill's approach. Before the war, Hitler had described to his adjutant his secretive mental processes. Bear in mind that my brain works like a calculating machine. Each person who makes a presentation to me introduces into this calculating machine a small wheel of information. There forms a certain picture or a number on each wheel. I press a button and there flashes into my mind the sum of all this information. Now the Hitler calculating machine began to build a conspiracy theory, which would have devastating consequences. On July the 6th, 1940, Hitler, the victor in Europe, returned to Berlin to a hero's welcome. Our wonderful July sun shines all over the place. An unimaginable ecstasy fills the city. The crowd roars. The station looks like a great banqueting hall. Then the Führer arrives. A roar of joy fills the station. On this day, Hitler's army chief, General Keitel, called him the greatest warlord in history. But amid his triumph, Hitler was increasingly tormented by one overriding thought. As far as he was concerned, he had won the war. So why did the British not recognize that fact and make peace with him? He began to convince himself that there must be some external factor that Britain and Churchill were relying on. A week after the Day of Glory in Berlin, General Halder recorded a momentous development in Hitler's reasoning. 13th of July, 1940. The Führer is greatly puzzled by Britain's persistent unwillingness to make peace. He sees the answer in Britain's hope in Russia. On July the 19th, 1940, in a speech to the Reichstag, Hitler made his final plea for peace to Britain. Churchill and the British were not interested. Later that day, a further wheel of information from the United States entered Hitler's mind. Franklin Roosevelt was nominated by the Democrat Party to run for president for the third time. His acceptance speech contained an attack on Nazi aggression. Hitler was now seeing spectres across the globe. 22nd of July, 1940. Führer's view. Reasons for continuation of war by Britain. One, it hopes for a change in America. Two, it puts hope in Russia. Stalin is flirting with Britain to keep her in the war and tie us down. Hitler retreated to the mountains of Obersalzburg. 
the delusion was building. Here, the summer before, he'd been dreaming up his pact with Stalin. Now, he suspected him. At the end of July, he announced to his generals the results of weeks of agonized reflection. 31st of July, 1940, 11.30, Berghof. Führer concludes, Russia is the factor on which Britain is relying the most. Something must have happened in London. The British were completely down. Now they have perked up again. With Russia smashed, Britain's last hope would be shattered. The sooner Russia is crushed, the better. If we were to start in May 1941, we would have five months to finish the job. It was, as yet, only an idea. But two enormous delusions. The first that he had already won the war, and the second that some secret deal was brewing between Britain and Russia, were leading Hitler down the road to catastrophe. For Hitler, the invasion of Russia was still only a contingency plan, should all other means of forcing the British to make peace fail. The autumn of 1940 now brought four long months of frustration. The RAF defeated the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain. Plans for a cross-channel invasion were quietly shelved. Yet despite these setbacks, Hitler kidded himself that he'd done enough. 15th of October, 1940. Führer on military situation, war is won, rest is mere question of time. But Hitler could still not force the British to come to terms. And he had become split-minded about Russia moving troops nearer her borders, but also wanting Stalin to join him in the fight against Britain. Hitler's adjutant, Major Gerhard Engel, noted in his diary. 4th of November, 1940. Führer visibly depressed. He conveys the impression that at the moment he does not know how things should proceed. Then came the defining moment. On November the 12th, 1940, the Russian foreign minister, Vyacheslav Molotov, arrived in Berlin at Hitler's invitation. Molotov was given the full Nazi fanfare, but the conversations that followed were tense. Hitler's purpose in summoning Molotov was to offer Russia a share in the spoils of victory if it helped him finish off the British. He told him... England's final capitulation is just a matter of time. Fragments of its empire will be left all over the world. It's time to think about division of this property without a master after our victory. But Stalin wasn't interested in joining Hitler's war or speculative carve-ups of the British Empire. His instructions to Molotov were to find out what Hitler's troops were up to in Finland and Romania, places right on his doorstep. Molotov put the questions bluntly. Hitler gave vague reassurances. Despite the superficial courtesies, Molotov's cold arrogance and his needling on the question of territory in Eastern Europe infuriated Hitler, and it reinvigorated him. 15th of November, 1940. The talks had shown where the Russian plans were heading. Molotov had let the cat out of the bag. Führer was really relieved. It would not even remain a marriage of convenience. When Molotov reported back to Moscow on the talks in Berlin, Stalin realized that Hitler was turning against him. In early December, 
he told his generals. We know that Hitler is intoxicated by his victories and believes that the Red Army will need at least four years to prepare for war. Obviously, four years would be more than enough for us. But we must be ready much earlier. We will try to delay the war for another two years. But Hitler was moving at a pace Stalin could not imagine. On December the 18th, 1940, he issued War Directive Number 23. The German Wehrmacht must be prepared before the ending of the war against England to crush Soviet Russia in a rapid campaign. The invasion date was set for May 1941. But behind the order lay uncertainty. 18th of December 1940. I'm convinced that the Führer himself does not know how it would turn out. He's very concerned at the lack of clarity as regards the strength of the Russians. Hopes for an English surrender. Does not think America will enter the war. Hitler had finally made the momentous decision. A war on two fronts. The very thing he'd sought to avoid when he first made his pact with Stalin. But he deluded himself that one front, Britain, was already won. It simply required a knockout blow against Russia for the British to understand their defeat. Hitler's line of reasoning never began to occur to Stalin. He believed that Hitler either had to beat Churchill or make a deal with him before he could think of turning against Russia. In early 1941, he told Politburo members, We must cherish no illusions. Fascist Germany is clearly preparing for an attack on the Soviet Union. Why does Hitler want to make an agreement with England? Because he wants to avoid war on two fronts. Stalin was trusting Hitler to act rationally. And to fight Britain and Russia at the same time was clearly irrational. But Stalin failed to realize that despite their similarities, there was one profound difference between him and Hitler, which made his perfect logic irrelevant. He himself was a methodical, calculating, hard-working man, a master of detail, personally signing death lists at one extreme and at the other, keeping the tiniest details of gold production in his notebook. Hitler, by contrast, was at heart an idle dreamer. He once described why he'd loved the mountains of Obersalzberg. When I go to Obersalzberg, I'm not drawn there merely by the beauty of the landscape. I feel myself far from petty things. My imagination is stimulated. When I study a problem elsewhere, I see it less clearly. I'm submerged by the details. By night at the Berghof, I often remain for hours with my eyes open, contemplating from my bed mountains lit up by the moon. It's at such moments that brightness enters my mind. For Hitler, the big idea was never to be disrupted by small facts. And having made up his mind to attack Russia for tactical reasons, the original and biggest idea of all was reasserting itself. The ideological struggle against Jews and Bolsheviks. Throughout 1940, Hitler had hardly mentioned the Jews. But on January the 30th, 1941, in his traditional speech, marking the anniversary of the Nazis' rise to power, he repeated a chilling threat he'd first made before war broke out. When es dem international Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. Musik 
At a series of conferences with his generals in the spring of 1941, Hitler made his aims brutally clear. 3rd of March, 1941. The forthcoming campaign will lead to a showdown between two different ideologies. The Jewish Bolshevik intelligentsia must be eliminated. 30th of March, we must forget the concept of comradeship between soldiers. This is a war of extermination. While Hitler planned his annihilation, Stalin still believed he had at least a year to prepare. On April the 13th, 1941, he moved to protect his back, signing a pact with Hitler's ally, Japan. Stalin was thrilled with his coup and got happily tipsy with the Japanese foreign minister, Matsuoki. But he was still following his double strategy. As he said goodbye to Matsuoki, the German military attaché in Moscow was present. Stalin told him, We must remain friends, and you must now do everything to that end. We will stay friends with you, whatever happens. But Stalin knew such long-term friendship was a fantasy. Soon after, he told graduates of Moscow's military academy, There will be war and the enemy will be Germany. But that war would not happen yet. Up until this point, Stalin's reasoning was irreproachable. He'd foreseen the eventual conflict with Germany and was steadily preparing for it. But a bizarre twist would now propel him into his own huge delusion. In April 1941, Stalin received his second letter from Winston Churchill. Like the first, it would have an electrifying effect on his duel with Hitler. Churchill told him the British had received intelligent reports of German troop movements, which could only be preparations for a Nazi attack on Russia. Stalin was instantly suspicious, not of Hitler, but of Churchill. He told his army chiefs, Britain is threatening us with the Germans, and threatening the Germans with the Soviet Union. They're playing us off against each other. Then on May the 10th, 1941, in one of the war's strangest moments, Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, took off from Germany in a Messerschmitt fighter, flew across the North Sea, and parachuted to the ground in Scotland. At that time, Stalin's assistant, present at his key meetings, was Yuri Chudayev, who noted down and later typed up everything Stalin said. From Chudayev's secret, unpublished record, it is possible to piece together how Churchill's message and Hess's flight began to lead Stalin towards a conspiracy theory, which would have immensely destructive consequences for his country. Three days after Hess landed, Chidayev recorded the interpretation Stalin gave of these two events. On the one hand, Churchill sends us a personal message in which he warns us about Hitler's aggressive intentions. And on the other hand, the British meet Hess, who is undoubtedly Hitler's confidant. What is the conclusion then? Apparently, when Churchill sent us his personal warning, he believed that we would activate our military machine. Then, Hitler would have a direct and fair reason to launch a preventive crusade against the Soviet Union. In Stalin's eyes, Churchill's warning was deliberately designed to provoke a war between Germany and Russia. And Churchill was meeting Hess to tell Germany it should strike first. As he brooded on this idea, Stalin concluded that Churchill was not the only provocateur. On June the 5th, he told his military chiefs, 
England, France and America see in Germany the only hope to get rid of Bolshevism and therefore help the Nazis in all possible ways in their crusade to the East. This deduction, that the democratic nations of Europe and America were ganging up on him, became a blinding article of faith. Throughout May and June, Intelligence reports gave warning after warning of imminent German attack. Stalin dismissed every one of them as part of the great conspiracy to provoke him. On June the 12th, he told his generals, I am certain that Hitler will not risk creating a second front by attacking the Soviet Union. Hitler is not such an idiot. Millions of German troops gathered within striking distance of Russia's borders. Operation Barbarossa, as it was now called, was scheduled for 10 days' time, June the 22nd. The duel between Hitler and Stalin was reaching its endgame. As Operation Barbarossa drew near, Hitler convinced himself he was fulfilling his destiny. On June the 16th, 1941, with six days to go, he told Goebbels, That which we have spent our lives fighting, we will now annihilate. Whether right or wrong, we must win. And when we have won, who will ask about the method? That day, a Soviet spy in the Luftwaffe sent yet another warning of imminent German attack. Stalin retorted, Tell the source in the staff of the German Air Force to f*** his mother. On June the 18th, Stalin's two top generals, Zhukov and Timoshenko, pleaded with him for a full alert. Stalin reminded them that Hitler could not attack without first doing a deal with Britain. You have to realize that Germany will never fight Russia on her own. You must understand this. On June the 20th, two days to go, Hitler chose his fanfare for victory. A passage from Liszt's symphonic poem, Les Prelude. Though Stalin still refused to see it coming, it was now apparent to his closest associates that the Nazis were on their way. On June the 21st, one of them, Georgi Dimitrov, was in Moscow. Rumors of an impending attack are multiplying on all sides. Have to be on guard. Called Molotov this morning. Molotov says the situation is unclear. There is a major game underway. June the 22nd, the same day Napoleon had once invaded Russia, Hitler followed in his footsteps. At 3.30 a.m. the attack begins, the greatest deployment in world history. The Führer is as if released from a bad dream, the nearer we get to the decisive moment. All his tiredness seems to disappear. I'm given a deep insight into his thoughts. We have no option but to attack. This cancerous abscess must be cauterized. Stalin will fall. At 7 a.m., I was urgently summoned to the Kremlin. Germany has attacked the USSR. The war has begun. Stalin to me. They attacked us without declaring any grievances, without demanding any negotiations. They attacked us viciously, like gangsters. 
Stalin's great conspiracy theory that the democracies were plotting to provoke him was shattered. His misreading of Hitler, the man he'd viewed as a rational strategist, was total. Hitler had completed an extraordinary mental journey. A year before, he had seen the invasion as a tactic to make Britain crumble. Now the ideology with which he had set out 20 years before had once again taken pride of place. He wrote to his Italian ally, Benito Mussolini. Let me say one more thing, Duce. Since I struggled through to this decision, I again feel spiritually free. The partnership with the Soviet Union was often very irksome to me, for in some way or other it seemed to me to be a break with my whole origin, my concepts and my former obligations. I am happy now to be relieved of these mental agonies. While Operation Barbarossa cleansed Hitler, it only shocked and depressed Stalin. His fury was directed equally at Hitler and at his own generals, whose positioning of their forces, insisted upon by Stalin himself, had allowed the Germans to smash through Russian defenses. This is a monstrous crime. Those responsible must lose their heads. NKVD units were sent to the front to arrest the guilty men. The commander, General Pavlov, was shot. Five days later, Stalin remarked, Lenin founded our state and we've fucked it up. The Red Army, taken by surprise because Stalin had refused to allow it to prepare, was in headlong retreat. Two weeks after the invasion, General Halder noted in his diary, 3rd of July, 1941. It is probably no overstatement to say that the Russian campaign has been won in the space of two weeks. Militarily, Barbarossa turned the war on its head. And his experience with Hitler also had a vital psychological effect on Stalin. He later remarked, When you're trying to make a decision, never put yourself into the mind of the other person, because if you do, you can make a terrible mistake. Stalin had lost the mind game. Hitler had outwitted him. But Hitler would be the eventual loser. His decision to attack Russia signed the death warrant of his own dreams of empire and of European imperialism in general. And it would create an unlikely coalition of three ideologically opposed warlords to fight him. But the relationship between the two great Democrats in that coalition began with another mental duel, which ran in parallel with the duel of the dictators. It On August the 15th, 1944, American and British troops invaded the south coast of France. Unlike D-Day in Normandy, ten weeks before, Operation Dragoon, as it was called, has passed by relatively unnoticed. Yet behind it was a ferocious dispute. The landings had been angrily opposed by the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. He told the American president, Franklin Roosevelt, they were the first major strategic and political error for which we too have to be responsible. The festering sore which underlay Churchill's outburst was not about his enemy, Hitler, but his ally, the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin. Operation Dragoon was the final act in a mental duel between Stalin and Churchill in which each man secretly plotted to impose his own will on the future of post-war Europe. As their duel progressed, Roosevelt entered the arena and also started to plot, behind Churchill's back. Eventually, he'd become the pivotal figure upon whom the duel's outcome would depend. 
At stake was the future freedom and independence of hundreds of millions of people. On the evening of Saturday, June 21, 1941, Winston Churchill held a dinner party at Chequers, the Prime Minister's country residence, in the Chiltern Hills outside London. Conversation was dominated by reports that Hitler was about to tear up his pact with Stalin and invade Russia. Among the guests was Churchill's private secretary, John Colvin. The PM says he will go all out to help Russia. I said that for him, the arch-anti-communist, this was bowing down in the House of Rimen. He replied that he had only one single purpose, the destruction of Hitler, and his life was much simplified thereby. If Hitler invaded hell, he would at least make a favorable reference to the devil. In the small hours of June the 22nd, three million Nazi troops smashed their way into Russia. Immediately, the arch-anti-communist welcomed Stalin as an ally. But Stalin remained suspicious of Churchill and believed that what he really wanted was for Germany and Russia to destroy each other. Churchill, for his part, feared that Stalin would do another deal with Hitler. In December 1941, the British Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, went to Moscow to start negotiations for a formal treaty with Russia, which would try to dispel these mutual suspicions. As Eden arrived, the Red Army was counter-attacking, but German forces remained dangerously close to Moscow. Even so, Stalin was already thinking long-term he intended to exact his price for carrying the brunt of the fight, particularly territory. Eden noted Stalin's demands. January the 3rd, 1942. As regards the special interests of the Soviet Union, Stalin desired the restoration of the position in 1941 prior to the German attack, in respect to the Baltic states, Finland and Bessarabia. Stalin also wanted back the eastern part of Poland, in sum, all the territory he'd grabbed as part of the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939. Top of his list was the Baltic states, which had only gained their independence from Russia after World War I. Eden told Churchill, I am clear that this question is for Stalin the acid test of our sincerity. Nothing we and the United States of America can do or say will affect the situation at end of war. If the Russians are victorious, they will be able to establish these frontiers, and we shall certainly not turn them out. Initially, Churchill was horrified by any thought of conceding to Stalin's demands. He replied to Eden, The 1941 frontiers of Russia were acquired by acts of aggression in shameful collusion with Hitler. The transfer of the people of the Baltic states to Soviet Russia against their will will be contrary to all the principles for which we are fighting this war. I know President Roosevelt holds this view as strongly as I do. These principles had been enshrined in the Atlantic Charter, which Roosevelt and Churchill had agreed during their meeting in Newfoundland in August 1941. Most importantly, they guaranteed the future freedom and independence of the nations conquered by Hitler. But Eden argued that what mattered more than principles was Stalin's cooperation, both now and in the future. Probably Stalin's demand is intended as an acid test to see what value we attach to that cooperation and what sacrifice of principle we're prepared to make in order to achieve it. In the coming weeks, Churchill's attitude began to be colored by disastrous turns in the war. 
In the Far East, Singapore had fallen to the Japanese. The Battle of the Atlantic was grim. Finally, Churchill did an about turn. On March the 7th, 1942, he wrote to Roosevelt that the Baltic states could be sacrificed to keep Stalin on side. The increasing gravity of the war has led me to feel that the principles of the Atlantic Charter ought not to be construed so as to deny Russia the frontier she occupied when Germany attacked her. The next day, the British ambassador to Washington, Lord Halifax, was summoned to the White House to discuss Churchill's cable. Roosevelt showed himself just as willing as Churchill to sacrifice the Baltic states, though he preferred to do it more furtively. FDR's mind is already moving along the only remaining line, that is of saying to Stalin that we all recognize his need for security, that to put anything on paper now is impossible, that future of Baltic states clearly depends upon Russian military progress, and that neither United States nor Great Britain would or could turn them out. Why then should Stalin worry? As early as March 1942, Churchill and Roosevelt had shown themselves willing to give away the future freedom of three independent nations. They'd been driven by the fear that Stalin and Hitler would do another deal. But, though the thought once or twice crossed the minds of both dictators, it was never a real possibility. Their submission to Stalin was unnecessary. It was also the beginning of a slippery slope. In May 1942, Stalin's foreign minister, Vyacheslav Molotov, dashingly clad in his flying gear, landed in Scotland. The first trip to Britain by a top Bolshevik since the revolution. Having nipped back into his plane to change into his suit, he took the train down to London. There, he was to finalize the treaty between Britain and Russia, which would conclude the negotiations begun in Moscow five months before. Stalin had given Molotov an extensive shopping list of territory that Britain must agree as part of the post-war Soviet Union. Then, suddenly, while Molotov was in London, Germany launched its summer offensive in Russia. Three Soviet armies were being smashed at the Battle of Kharkov. Stalin's priorities instantly changed. He was desperate for military help from the British and Americans. He cabled Molotov to sign the treaty and stop arguing about territory. That would look after itself. 24th of May, 1942. The question of future borders will be decided by force. The military relief Stalin wanted was a cross-channel invasion of France as a second front against Hitler. But Churchill believed it was premature and would be a disaster against the heavily defended French coast. In August 1942, he flew to Moscow to tell Stalin the invasion had to be delayed. It was an epic, dangerous journey. Some 40 hours flying in a stripped out American bomber via Gibraltar, Cairo and Tehran in four long overnight stretches. His first steps on Russian soil came with a Chichilian rallying cry. We will continue hand in hand like comrades and brothers until every vestige of the Nazi regime has been beaten into the ground. General Alan Brooke, the British Chief of Staff, accompanied Churchill. He recorded this first ever face-to-face -face meeting of any of the other warlords with Stalin. August the 13th, 1942. The two leaders, Churchill and Stalin, are poles apart as human beings. 
and I cannot see a friendship between them such as exists between Roosevelt and Winston. Stalin is a realist with little flattery about him. Facts only count with him. Plans, hypotheses, future possibilities mean little. At their first meeting, Churchill said the invasion of France must be postponed till 1943. He then projected a vision of his alternative plan. He told Stalin that first the Allies would land in the northwest of Africa and drive the Germans out. Then he drew a map in the shape of a crocodile. The hard snout, he explained, was the heavily defended coast of France. Churchill said that rather than invade there, he wanted to attack Hitler in what he called the soft underbelly of Europe, the Adriatic and the Balkans. Stalin questioned him curtly, but politely. The next day, Stalin's mood turned vicious. He accused the British of cowardice. You British are too afraid to fight the Germans. If you tried it like us Russians, you would not find it so bad. Churchill reacted with eloquent fury. I have come all round Europe in the midst of my troubles. Yes, Mr. Stalin, I have my troubles as well as you, hoping to meet the hand of comradeship. And I am bitterly disappointed. I have not that hand. Later that night, Churchill told his staff he would leave Moscow forthwith. But Stalin had been impressed by Churchill's passion, and on the third night, a banquet at the Kremlin broke the ice. From the beginning, vodka flowed freely and one's glass kept being filled up. The tables groaned under every description of hors d'oeuvre and fish, etc. Molotov was opposite Stalin and started proposing toasts within five minutes of our having sat down. These toasts went on continuously. By the end of the dinner, Stalin was quite lively, walking around the table to click glasses with various people he was proposing the health of. He is an outstanding man, there is no doubt about that, but not an attractive one. Whenever I look at him, I can imagine his sending off people to their doom without ever turning a hair. During the dinner, Churchill made an aside that Stalin was a peasant whom he could handle. His aides were horrified and later, back in his room, warned him the Russians were bugging everything. Churchill said very loudly, The Russians, I have been told, are not human beings at all. They are lower in the scale of nature than the orang-utang. Now then, let them take that down and translate it into Russian. At times, it had been touch and go. But by the end of the visit, goodwill had broken out. PM was somewhat late, and no wonder. He went to see Stalin for final visit at 7 p.m. and remained with him until 3 a.m. He had no time for bed, and after a bath, came straight to the aerodrome. The band played the Internationale, God Save the King, and the Star Spangled Banner, during which period we all stood to attention and saluted. As Churchill returned to his war-torn country, he believed he had at least established a working relationship with Stalin. He wrote to Roosevelt, On the whole, I am definitely encouraged by my visit to Moscow. Now they know the worst, and having made their protest, are entirely friendly. But just two months later, an extraordinary message from Stalin to his ambassador in London showed that Churchill's optimism was illusory. Stalin remained deeply suspicious of what he saw as Britain's lack of military support and repeated his long-held fears of Churchill's secret motives. We in Moscow get the impression that Churchill is aiming at the ultimate defeat of the Soviet Union in order then to come to some agreement with Germany at the expense of our country. Stalin even suggested that Churchill was intending to use Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, who was in British captivity, as a negotiating lever with the Nazis. 
In the coming months, military success pushed political suspicion for a while to one side. Rommel was beaten at the Battle of El Alamein. The Americans and British landed successfully in the northwest of Africa. The Russians defeated the Germans at Stalingrad. Military success was bringing the post-war world nearer. Then, in April 1943, a shocking discovery put the shape of that world into sharp relief. Germany announced that the bodies of thousands of Polish officers had been found in Katyn Forest, shot by the Russians in the spring of 1940. Moscow angrily rejected the claims as Nazi propaganda. But at a private lunch, Churchill said, Alas, the German revelations are probably true. The Bolsheviks can be very cruel. Katyn had a devastating series of knock-on effects. The London-based Polish government in exile, the government for which Britain had gone to war, suspected the Russians were guilty and demanded an investigation by the International Red Cross. Stalin said the demand by the London Poles was a hostile act against the Soviet Union. He already disliked them as they stood for a free and independent Poland. He now used the row over Katyn as an excuse to break off relations with them. Churchill was caught between his loyalty to the London Poles and his wish to preserve good relations with Stalin. In Washington, Roosevelt sensed the tension Katyn was creating. He secretly decided it was time that he, rather than Churchill, became the prime mover in the relationship with the Soviet leader. On May the 5th, 1943, he wrote Stalin a private letter, asking for an informal one-to-one -one get together. The only question was where. Iceland I do not like, because for both you and me it involves rather risky flights, and in addition, would make it quite frankly difficult not to invite Prime Minister Churchill at the same time. Therefore, I suggest that we could meet either on your side or my side of the Bering Straits. Roosevelt dispatched an emissary, Joseph Davis, who'd been his ambassador to Russia in the late 1930s, to hand deliver the letter to Stalin. While Davis was in Moscow, Churchill was in Washington. He spent a fortnight with Roosevelt. Not once did the president breathe a word of his private approach to Stalin. On May the 26th, with Churchill safely gone, Roosevelt received a positive reply from Stalin. As I do not know how events will develop on the Soviet-German front in June, I shall not be able to leave Moscow during that month. I therefore suggest holding the meeting in July or August. But Roosevelt's secret plan was about to hit a snag. He and Churchill had decided to postpone the invasion of France to 1944. They believed British and American forces were still not strong enough to beat the German defences. Stalin responded angrily to his allies' delay. The Soviet government cannot align itself with this decision, which was adopted without its participation. Churchill was worried by Stalin's hostile reaction. And by now he had also got wind of Roosevelt's secret letter. He tried to flush Roosevelt out. All this makes me anxious to know anything you may care to tell me about your letter sent to Stalin by Mr. Davis and the answer which has been received from him. I will, of course, come anywhere you wish to a rendezvous. Churchill still had no inkling he was to be excluded. 
Finally, Roosevelt came clean. On June the 24th, his special envoy in London, Averill Harriman, went to Downing Street and told Churchill what had been going on. Churchill was shattered. He rang his foreign secretary, Anthony Eden. Went round to see Winston at midnight at his request. Found him considerably upset by a message from FDR that his projected meeting will be a deux. Churchill not only felt personally betrayed, he could also sense the blow to British power. And he could see that Roosevelt, in trying to hijack the relationship with Stalin, was taking the first steps to an American-Russian partnership which would determine the future world. The next day, controlling his emotions as best he could, he wrote one of the most important letters of his life. Former naval person to president, personal and secret. Avril told me last night of your wish for a meeting with Uncle Joe in Alaska, adieu. You must excuse me expressing myself with all the frankness that our friendship and the gravity of the issue warrant. I do not underrate the use that enemy propaganda would make of a meeting between the heads of Soviet Russia and the United States at this juncture, with the British Commonwealth and Empire excluded. It would be serious and vexatious, and many would be bewildered and alarmed thereby. Nevertheless, whatever you decide, I shall sustain to the best of my ability here. Churchill had been kept in the dark for six full weeks by the ally he thought to be his friend. Four days later, Roosevelt replied with a flat lie. I did not suggest to Uncle Joe that we meet alone, but he told Davies that he assumed A, that we would meet alone, and B, that he agreed that we should not bring staffs to what would be a preliminary meeting. In August, Stalin finally turned down Roosevelt's request for a meeting, claiming the pressures of war as his excuse. For the moment, Roosevelt was thwarted. Beyond the deceit and the power play, the distressing episode left Churchill with a further troubling thought. Up until now, both he and Roosevelt had handled Stalin with kid gloves but Churchill was becoming split-minded. On one side, he believed that he, as one great man, could deal with Stalin, another great man, by face-to-face -face diplomacy. But on the other side, the Katyn massacre had reawakened all his old fears of the Bolsheviks. A nightmare was forming that Stalin was at the head of a Russian colossus which would devour much of Europe before the British and Americans could get there and create a new totalitarian empire. Churchill had long feared that a cross-channel invasion against the heavily defended French coast would bring dreadful carnage. Instead, he favoured his alternative strategy of attacking Germany via the Adriatic and the Balkans. By the autumn of 1943, the British and Americans had landed in southern Italy. Churchill's vision seemed to him possible. But Stalin had sent angry cables demanding that the Allies concentrate only on the invasion of France. Roosevelt's special envoy in Britain, Avril Harriman, reported to the President. Churchill's only explanation is that Stalin wants us to become involved in Western Europe to avoid our entry in the Balkans. Churchill was accusing Stalin of trying to use military arguments to further his political purpose of controlling Eastern Europe and the Balkans after the war. Later, in his memoirs, Churchill denied that at that stage, 
when Hitler was still far from beaten, he too tried to bend Allied military strategy to his political purposes, in Churchill's case, to keep Stalin out of Eastern Europe and protect British interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. But there is evidence that Churchill was being less than frank about his motives in the crucial last few months of 1943. In August 1943, the British and Americans met at Quebec to decide the next stage in the war. Churchill knew it would be fatal to suggest to Roosevelt that they should try to beat the Russians to the Balkans and Eastern Europe for political reasons. To Roosevelt, that would smack of the European imperialism he loathed. So Churchill argued for his alternative strategy on purely military grounds. But one chance remark revealed his inner thoughts. Stalin is an unnatural man. There will be grave troubles. At Quebec, Churchill reluctantly agreed to the American view that preparations for the invasion of France should take precedence over his alternative strategy. But back in London, Churchill began to renege. Further evidence of his political motives emerged at an extraordinary war cabinet meeting in early October. The Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, gave an account of what happened to Oliver Harvey, his private secretary. The PM spoke for three hours. He talked great nonsense, and A.E. was furious. The PM kept saying such things as, we mustn't weaken Germany too much. We may need her against Russia. The cabinet colleagues were horrified at all this. Churchill's remarks showed that Stalin's suspicions of 12 months before had not been so outlandish. Churchill now sanctioned a British operation against the island of Rhodes. Capturing Rhodes was a vital stepping stone in his alternative strategy. He hoped that it would bring Turkey into the war, providing an easy gateway to Eastern Europe. The American chiefs of staff thought it a wasteful diversion. Churchill pleaded his case to Roosevelt. I am sure that the omission to take roads at this stage and the ignoring of the whole position in the Eastern Mediterranean would constitute a cardinal error in strategy. On military grounds, Churchill's chief of staff, General Brooke, was not against the operation. But why risk a row with Roosevelt? I am slowly becoming convinced that in his age, Winston is becoming less and less balanced. I can control him no more. He has worked himself into a frenzy of excitement about the Rhodes attack, has magnified its importance so that he can no longer see anything else, and has set his heart on capturing this one island, even at the expense of endangering his relations with the President. While Churchill fanatically plotted his alternative strategy, his foreign secretary, Anthony Eden, was attending a foreign minister's conference in Moscow. From there, Eden cabled Churchill that Stalin was continuing to insist his allies must concentrate only on the invasion of France, Operation Overlord, as it was now called. Churchill was livid. His doctor, Charles Moran, who kept contemporaneous notes of their conversations, which he later wrote up into a diary, recorded his reaction. October the 26th, 1943. When I called at number 10 this morning, I found the PM glowering over a telegram from Eden. His face was glum, his jaw set, misgivings filled his mind. Stalin seems obsessed by this bloody second front, he muttered angrily. I can be obstinate too. Damn the fellow, he said under his breath. 
Churchill now ordered Eden to tell Stalin that the invasion of France might need postponing in order to reinforce his favoured campaign in Italy. In Washington, there was fury at Churchill's reckless disregard for agreed Allied strategy. The American War Secretary, Henry Stimson, noted in his diary, this shows how determined Churchill is with all his lip service to stick a knife into the back of Overlord, and I feel more bitterly about it than I ever have before. In Moscow, Anthony Eden and his team were just as angry. The PM is untamable. He cannot leave well alone, and he loathes the Russians. He would torpedo AE's conference lightheartedly. Churchill's plotting was getting him nowhere. And for Stalin, the Moscow conference had one pleasing outcome. It was agreed that all liberated territories would be administered by the occupying power. Stalin told his closest associates, Now the fate of Europe is settled. We shall do as we like with the Allies' consent. In November 1943, Churchill left Britain for a long trip, first to Malta. Amid the acclamation, he was angrier than ever. His campaign in the eastern Mediterranean was failing. German forces beat the British out of the Greek island of Leros. Churchill blamed it on the United States' refusal to supply enough resources. November the 18th, 1943. PM gave long tirade on evils of Americans and of our losses in the Aegean and Dalmatian coast. At this point, Churchill's wife, Clementine, hearing of her husband's vile mood, wrote him a long and soothing letter. My darling, I'm afraid that so far your journey has not been pleasant or refreshing. Your cold must have made you miserable and uncomfortable. And then I know Leros must cause you deep unhappiness. But never forget that when history looks back, your vision and your piercing energy, coupled with your patience and magnanimity, will all be part of your greatness. So don't allow yourself to be made angry. I often think of your saying that the only worse thing than allies is not having allies. From Malta, Churchill flew to Cairo. He was feeling better, and Clementine's letter helped to restore his spirits. Roosevelt had also traveled to Cairo, and, once in his presence, Churchill, as always, succumbed to his charms. He told his daughter, Sarah, I love that man. But Roosevelt refused all Churchill's pleas to discuss his alternative strategy. He continued to suspect Churchill's imperialist motives and told him, Winston, you have 400 years of acquisitive instinct in your blood, and you just don't understand how a country might not want to acquire land somewhere, even if they can get it. A new period is opened in the world's history, and you will have to adjust yourself to it. It was said teasingly, but threw Churchill into despair. He told Harold Macmillan, the British minister in North Africa. Germany is finished, though it may take some time to clean up the mess. The real problem is Russia. I can't get the Americans to see it. The final destination was Tehran, and the first face-to-face -face meeting of the three Allied war lords. This would be the defining moment in the Churchill-Stalin duel, with Roosevelt the pivotal figure. For the president, the problem was now Churchill and his backsliding on the invasion of France. Shortly before the conference began, Charles Moran found himself talking to Roosevelt's closest associate, Harry Hopkins. Harry Hopkins thinks that the PM is trying to get out of his commitments. 
Sure we are preparing for a battle at Tehran, he threatened. You will find us lining up with the Russians. What I find so shocking is that to the Americans, the PM is the villain of the piece. They are far more skeptical of him than they are of Stalin. Superficially, Tehran was full of pleasantries. Churchill and Roosevelt presented Stalin with a sword to commemorate the victory at Stalingrad. Stalin handed it on to his army psychic, General Voroshilov, who promptly dropped it. Churchill's birthday, his 69th, fell during the conference. He hosted a splendid dinner and Roosevelt gave him a valuable cash and bowl with a note. With my affection, may we be together for many years. In this gathering of great men, Churchill's ambivalence towards Stalin re-emerged. He believed again he could do deals with him and secretly agreed, without telling the London Poles, that Russia should have the part of Eastern Poland it had gained under the Nazi-Soviet pact. Poland would be compensated with land from Germany. Roosevelt, fearing the potential reaction of Poles in America, did not want to be directly involved in the deal, but privately went along with it. Also, Churchill and Roosevelt confirmed to Stalin they would not oppose the Baltic states becoming part of the post-war Soviet Union. But when it came to the overriding issue of military strategy, on which Churchill believed the rest of Eastern Europe's future might depend, he was out on a limb. Stalin and Roosevelt insisted there should be no delay in Operation Overlord. Roosevelt then left Stalin the choice of which supporting operation the British and Americans should prepare, the Eastern Mediterranean, as Churchill wanted, or a follow-up invasion of southern France. Stalin declared, Our directive should stipulate, in conformity with the desires of the Russians, an invasion in the south of France. The operations in the Mediterranean, of which Churchill speaks, are merely diversionary. It was the killer blow. That night, after he finally lost the argument, Churchill returned to his room with Charles Moran. Now his other image of Stalin took over again, the future totalitarian oppressor. He pulled up abruptly so that he stood looking down at me, his eyes popping. I believe man might destroy man and wipe out civilization. Europe would be desolate and I may be held responsible. Until he came here, the PM could not bring himself to believe that face to face with Stalin, that democracies would take different courses. Now he sees he cannot rely on the president's support. What matters more, he realizes that the Russians see this too. Stalin will be able to do as he pleases. Will he become a menace to the free world? Another Hitler? The PM is appalled by his own impotence. Churchill was defeated. Events in the coming months rubbed salt in his wounds. As the Red Army raced into Poland, the British and Americans were ground down in a long, hard slog in Italy. D-Day, the invasion of France, which Churchill had opposed for so long, drew near. He was a disappointed man. May the 7th, 1944. He looked very old and very tired. He said he could still always sleep well, eat well, and especially drink well, but that he no longer jumped out of bed the way he used to, and felt as if he would be quite content to spend the whole day in bed. I have never yet heard him admit that he was beginning to fail. Then, on June the 4th, 1944, Rome finally fell to the British and Americans. With Nazi resistance beginning to crumble, they headed north through Italy. Churchill suddenly saw a last gasp opportunity.
D-Day, June the 6th, 1944. The invasion of France was underway, with far fewer immediate casualties than Churchill had ever imagined possible. Two weeks later, the Russian army launched its summer offensive. While the British and Americans slogged their way through France, there seemed every prospect that all of Eastern and Central Europe would fall to Stalin, as Churchill had long feared. But now, at the very last minute, Churchill saw one final chance to win his duel with Stalin. After the fall of Rome, Many of the British and American troops in Italy were supposed to be switching to the invasion of southern France, Operation Dragoon, which had been agreed at Tehran and was scheduled for mid-August. But British commanders in Italy now suggested a breakout via Trieste and Ljubljana into the Balkans and Central Europe, the very thing Churchill had always wanted his alternative strategy to achieve. The overall Allied commander General Eisenhower would have no truck with it. Witheringly, he cabled Roosevelt. Wandering off overland via Trieste and Ljubljana, repeat, Ljubljana, is to indulge in conjecture to an unwarranted degree at the present time. Cables flew across the Atlantic as Churchill and Roosevelt fought out the battle of strategies. Finally, Roosevelt confessed his overriding concern. I am mindful of our agreement with Stalin as to an operation against the south of France. I cannot accept without consultation with Stalin any course of action which abandons this operation. Churchill was enraged. Yet again, Stalin was dictating events. The planned invasion of southern France seemed to him pointless. On June the 30th, he drafted the strongest words he had ever written to the president. I cannot exaggerate the seriousness of this issue. The whole campaign in Italy is being ruined. If my departure from the scene would ease matters by tendering my resignation to the king, I would gladly make this contribution. But I fear that the demand of the public to know the reasons would do great injury to the fighting troops in the Mediterranean. But no one contemplated that everything that was hopeful in the Mediterranean should be flung on one side, like the rind of an orange, in order that some minor benefice might come to help the theatre of your command. So strong was the language that Churchill, having drafted it, sat on the cable. That night, he met his military chiefs. General Brooke now realized the argument would get the British nowhere. June the 29th, 1944. Just back from a meeting with Winston. I thought at first we might have trouble with him. He looked like he wanted to fight the president. However, in the end, we got him to agree to our outlook, which is, all right, if you insist on being damned fools, sooner than falling out with you, which would be fatal, we shall be damned fools with you, and we shall see that we perform the role of damned fools damned well. A new telegram was drafted. Churchill reluctantly conceded, but told Roosevelt the decision was the first major strategic and political error for which we, too, have to be responsible. It was the first time Churchill had admitted to Roosevelt his ulterior political motive. And as for consulting Stalin, what would be the point? As Churchill put it, with pained understatement. On a long-term political view, Stalin might prefer that the British and the Americans do their share in France in the very hard fighting that is to come, and that East, Middle and Southern Europe should fall naturally into his control.
on August the 15th, 1944, Allied forces invaded southern France in Operation Dragoon. Militarily, the invasion was a success, reinforcing the push through France. As to whether Churchill's alternative strategy could have been more successful, opinion is divided. But one man agreed with him. Mark Clark, the top American general in Italy. After the war, Clark wrote, The weakening of the campaign in Italy in order to invade southern France instead of pushing on into the Balkans was one of the outstanding mistakes of the war. Stalin knew exactly what he wanted, and the thing he most wanted was to keep us out of the Balkans. A campaign that might have changed the whole history of relations between the Western world and the Soviet Union was permitted to fade away. Whether or not Clark and Churchill were right, there was nothing physically that British and Americans could now do to stop the Russian army occupying the nations of Eastern Europe and the Balkans. But would Stalin allow those nations their freedom? Roosevelt had vetoed the use of military strategy to block Stalin. It would now be up to him to persuade the Soviet leader to play the democratic game. Theirs would be the final duel of the warlords and decide what sort of Europe emerged from the ashes. April the 12th, 1945, dawned brightly at the country retreat of the American president, Franklin Roosevelt. His companion, Daisy Sukli, was with him. Another beautiful day. F woke up with a slight headache and a stiff neck, which probably comes from being overtired. Despite his exhaustion, Roosevelt was having to face up to an agonizing dilemma. He had reached the pivotal moment in a psychological duel he'd been waging with his wartime ally, the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin. Roosevelt had steadfastly followed one consistent course, which he believed was the way to win Stalin's collaboration in creating a better world. He'd once put it like this. I think if I give Stalin everything I possibly can and ask nothing from him in return, noblesse oblige, he won't try to annex anything and will work with me for a world of peace and democracy. Now, as the war entered its final stage, Roosevelt's great gamble with Stalin hung in the balance. Would the Soviet leader repay his generosity? Or was he the oppressor, building a new totalitarian empire? At stake, was the freedom and independence of the nations of Europe and the future of hundreds of millions of people. July the 20th, 1944, fate decreed that the war would be fought to the bitter end. Hitler survived an assassination attempt at his eastern headquarters, the Wolf's Lair. He would never surrender. Inevitably, Europe would end up under the control of the Americans and British advancing from the west and the Russians from the east. But what sort of Europe? On the evening of the assassination attempt, Hitler remarked, This war must be won or Europe will be lost to Bolshevism. I am the only one who sees the danger and the only one who can stop it. Hitler believed Bolshevism could only be stopped by war. Franklin Roosevelt thought the opposite. From the moment Russia was forced into war in 1941, Roosevelt had instinctively understood that he and Stalin would emerge as the two leaders of the two powers upon whom long-term peace would depend. 
but culturally and politically, they were a world apart. Roosevelt was an American patrician, brought up in luxury and educated at Harvard. Stalin, a cobbler's son, beaten by his father, his university the cells of revolution. In the 1930s, Roosevelt was the optimistic face of America's New Deal, Stalin, the paranoid orchestrator of Russia's terror. Despite these differences, Roosevelt believed it was possible to persuade Stalin, by using the carrot, not the stick, to adopt a more democratic view of the world. He also believed that he, an American progressive, rather than anyone tainted by old-fashioned European imperialism, was the man to do it. As early as spring 1942, he'd written to Churchill, Stalin hates the guts of all your top people. He thinks he likes me better, and I hope he will continue to do so. For over two years, Roosevelt conducted his relationship with Stalin via messages and intermediaries. Then, in November 1943, at the Tehran Conference, he finally met him face to face. His tactic was to find a common bond with Stalin by teasing Churchill. Later, he described to a colleague how, on the third morning, he finally got through. I said, lifting my hand to cover a whisper, which of course had to be interpreted, Winston is cranky this morning. He got up on the wrong side of the bed. A vague smile passed over Stalin's eyes, and I decided I was on the right track. I began to tease Churchill about his Britishness, about John Bull, about his cigars, about his habits. Winston got red and scowled, and the more he did so, the more Stalin smiled. Finally, Stalin broke into a deep, hearty guffaw, and for the first time in three days, I saw the light. The ice was broken, and we talked like men and brothers. Stalin behaved respectfully toward Roosevelt, in marked contrast to the rudeness he sometimes displayed to Churchill. And Roosevelt concluded from their conversations that Stalin was fundamentally a practical man he could do business with. He was hopeful that trust would build. In July 1944, he was relaxing at his country house, Hyde Park, with his close companion and confidant, Daisy Sukli, who kept a detailed diary of her conversations with the president. July 3rd, 1944. I told the P that his relations with Stalin are one of the great triumphs of his career, and only the future can tell how much that relationship is going to count in rebuilding our shattered world. Before they met, there was doubt and suspicion on Stalin's part, and also probably on the P's. Now there is the basis for talking, for working things out together. The P smiled at me and said he keeps his fingers crossed. The first concrete test of how far Roosevelt was succeeding with Stalin would be Poland. By the summer of 1944, Russian forces were smashing through Poland in their drive towards Germany. But beneath military success lay political division. Stalin had broken off relations with the London-based Polish government in exile after it had accused Russia of murdering thousands of Polish officers at Katyn Forest in 1940. Instead, he was backing a group of communist Poles based in Moscow as a future Polish government. But in a letter to Roosevelt and Churchill at the end of July, Stalin showed a more conciliatory face. I understand the importance of the Polish question for the common cause of the Allies, and for this very reason I am prepared to give assistance to all Poles and to mediate in the attainment of an agreement between them. For Roosevelt, 
The message seemed a vindication that his tactics with Stalin were working. That month, he gave an unequivocal assurance to the Prime Minister of the London Poles, Stanislav Mikolachuk. Don't worry. Stalin doesn't intend to take freedom from you. I shall see to it that your country does not come out of this war injured. Events in Poland were about to test both Stalin's sincerity and Roosevelt's strength of purpose. On August the 1st, 1944, the Polish National Underground Army in Warsaw, knowing the Russians were close by, rose up against the Nazis. A terrible tragedy, which would cast a dark shadow on the behavior of the two warlords, was about to unfold. By the end of July 1944, Allied forces from both East and West had their sights on Germany. After the D-Day landings, the British and Americans were about to break out of Normandy. The Red Army had reached the River Vistula, just 15 miles from the Polish capital, Warsaw. Then, on August the 1st, the Polish underground in Warsaw started an uprising against the Nazis. It was depending on the Russian forces just a few miles away to help. Its future was in Stalin's hands. But at this very moment, the State Department in Washington forwarded to Roosevelt a desperate message it had received from the commander of the Polish underground. It concerned the activities of the NKVD, Stalin's secret police, in areas of Poland already liberated by Russian troops. The Soviet authorities are arresting the officers in command and the staffs of the Polish underground army. The same fate undoubtedly awaits the leaders of the Polish underground civilian administration. Please do your best to save these people from liquidation by the NKVD. On August the 8th, a week into the rising, the Russian commander on the Vistula was ready to cross the river and head for Warsaw. Inside the city, the Nazis were bringing in massive firepower to suppress the rising. The underground appealed for help. On its behalf, Churchill cabled Stalin. 12th of August. I have seen a distressing message from the Poles in Warsaw, who after 10 days are still fighting against considerable German forces which have cut the city into three. They implore machine guns and ammunition. Can you not give them some further help? Because of Soviet secrecy, there is no documentation of Stalin's motives during the next few days. They can only be deduced from his actions. He could see that the fiercely independent Polish underground which would resist any future Soviet puppet government, was both distracting Nazi forces and at the same time being killed off by them. He also knew that Warsaw was a tough military target. He decided to halt the army on the Vistula and not to help the Warsaw Poles. Instead, he turned his attention to a softer target in Eastern Europe, Romania and he claimed to Churchill that the Polish underground had acted irresponsibly in starting the uprising and did not deserve support. August 16th, 1944. After probing more deeply into the Warsaw affair, I have come to the conclusion that the Warsaw action is a reckless and fearful gamble, taking a heavy toll of the population. Churchill forwarded Stalin's message to Roosevelt. 
At the same time, Roosevelt's ambassador in Moscow, Avril Harriman, who'd so far tended to trust Stalin, now began to suspect his motives. He cabled the president. The Soviet government's refusal to help Warsaw is not based on operational difficulties, nor on a denial of the conflict, but on ruthless political calculations. Stalin's decision meant that the only way to help the Poles was by British and American airdrops. But their planes were based far away in Britain and Italy. Their chances of consistent success depended on being able to refuel in Russian bases the other side of Warsaw before returning home. The Russians refused permission for refueling. Roosevelt agreed to a suggestion by Churchill that they should jointly appeal to Stalin to rethink. We believe that all three of us should do the utmost to save as many of the Patriots as possible. We hope that you will drop immediate supplies and munitions to the Patriot Poles in Warsaw. Or will you agree to help our planes in doing it very quickly? Within 48 hours, Stalin turned down his allies' appeal in a crescendo of abuse at the Poles who were dying in their thousands to liberate Warsaw from the Nazis. Sooner or later, the truth about the handful of power-seeking criminals who launched the Warsaw adventure will out. The next day, Roosevelt was sent by Churchill an eyewitness report of the horrors in Warsaw. The dead, it said, are buried in backyards and squares. Roosevelt replied, I do not see that we can take any additional steps at the present time that promise results. Roosevelt. Churchill persisted. He asked Roosevelt to join him in sending a second request to Stalin for refueling facilities. Roosevelt responded with a second put-down. I do not consider it advantageous to the long-range general war prospect for me to join with you in the proposed message to Uncle Joe. While the people of Warsaw rotted, Roosevelt would do no more privately or publicly to upset Stalin. In these same days, Paris was being liberated from the Nazis. There, the French underground had also risen against their occupiers when they knew the Allies were drawing near. But in Paris, the British and Americans diverted troops to help their fight. On August the 30th, Stalin's forces entered Romania's capital, Bucharest, and headed for Bulgaria. While his troops halted outside Warsaw, Eastern Europe was falling into his hands. Avril Harriman believes Stalin's ruthless duplicity required a reappraisal of Roosevelt's tactics. He cabled the president's closest associate, Harry Hopkins, in the White House. There is every indication that the Soviet Union will become a world bully wherever their interests are involved, unless we take issue with the present policy. But Roosevelt had no intention of changing tack. At this time, he was meeting Churchill at a conference in Quebec. Both men had lost interest in the Warsaw Rising. It was not once discussed. And Roosevelt had other things on his mind. He was campaigning to be re-elected president for a fourth term. But he was carrying a secret. Six months before, his doctors had diagnosed hypertension in his heart. Though his illness was kept under wraps, his physical decline was obvious. 
At Quebec, Roosevelt's companion, Daisy Sukli, compared the president and the prime minister. The PM looks better to me because he is not so florid and not so fat as he was. The Prez, on the other hand, worries me. He gets so awfully tired and has no chance to rest. This campaign will wear him still further. Churchill's wife, Clementine, also noticed the change. She wrote to her daughter, Mary, from Roosevelt's country house, where she and Churchill had gone on to stay. The president, with all his genius, does not, indeed cannot, partly because of his health and partly because of his makeup, function round the clock like your father. I should not think that his mind was pinpointed on the war for more than four hours a day, which is not really enough when one is a supreme warlord. Despite his ill health, Roosevelt was determined to carry on as president, convinced that he, better than anyone else, could bring a lasting peace to the world. I have already indicated to you why I accept the nomination. The key to that remained his handling of Stalin, and he continued to see evidence that it was working. The Poles of Warsaw were still fighting on, and seven weeks into the rising, Stalin at last agreed to airdrop limited aid. On September the 24th, he presented a very different face to Harriman. For the first time, Stalin spoke with sympathy for the insurgents. He said that the Red Army was in contact with each of the groups, by radio and by men going back and forth. Stalin showed none of his previous vindictiveness. Did Stalin mean it? Or was he being cynically opportunistic? The simple fact was that the Nazis had effectively destroyed the Polish underground. And with the deed done, magnanimity came free. On October the 2nd, the Warsaw Uprising was over. The underground commander, General Boer, surrendered to the Nazis. Nearly a quarter of a million people died. One of the last broadcasts from Warsaw said, May God, who is just, pass judgment on the terrible injustice suffered by the Polish nation, and may he punish accordingly all those who are guilty. The Warsaw tragedy had a vital impact on the three Allied warlords. For Roosevelt, Stalin's about turn at the end showed that his behavior could be moderated by friendly appeals. At this time, he compared the Soviet Union with a growing child, which had to toddle before it could learn to walk. Stalin could conclude that even when he behaved badly, Roosevelt would not confront him. And Churchill saw that if confrontation was out, the best way to preserve British influence in Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean was to do a deal with Stalin. In October 1944, he went to Moscow to do just that. Stalin was on his best behavior. Among his other murderous talents, he'd always had the ability to charm. Avril Harriman reported back to Roosevelt. Stalin was in high mood yesterday. He paid Churchill an unusual and significant compliment by attending the ballet at the Opera House. Now that Stalin's collaboration was his only hope, Churchill began to paint him in warmer colors, writing home to Clementine. I have had very nice talks with the old bear. I like him the more I see him. Now they respect us here, and I'm sure they wish to work with us. I have to keep the president in constant touch, and this is the delicate side. 
Roosevelt had suspected, rightly, that Churchill was up to his old imperialist tricks. At one of his tete-a-tetes with Stalin, Churchill secretly produced what he later called his naughty document, carving up Eastern Europe into British and Russian spheres of influence. In Romania and Bulgaria, the Russians would have 90% influence, in Greece the British 90%, Yugoslavia and Hungary 50-50. Churchill guiltily told Stalin, It is better to express these things in diplomatic terms and not to use the phrase dividing into spheres, because the Americans might be shocked. But though the naughty document remained secret, Roosevelt was informed of the broad thrust of the deal, and he was not shocked. What mattered to him was that Churchill was now trying to seek compromise with Stalin rather than confrontation. In November, Roosevelt was re-elected president for an unprecedented fourth term. He must have known he was unlikely to live for its full four years and was a man in a hurry. He'd long had a vision of a post-war world in which the great powers, Russia and the United States, along with Britain and China, would act, in his words, as policemen allowing the rest of the world's nations their freedom and independence, but ensuring they could not start wars. Stalin had warmed to Roosevelt's idea, which would place the Soviet Union at the top table of the world's nations. Now Roosevelt's great and final mission was to turn the dream into practical reality. It all depended on winning Stalin's collaboration, not in words, but in deeds. Nineteen forty five would see not just the end game on the battlefield, but also the end game in the private war of the warlords. For Hitler, the outlook was clear. He told his adjutant, I know the war is lost. I'd like most of all to put a bullet through my head. We'll not capitulate, never. We can go down, but we will take a world with us. Hitler's world was dissolving. By January 1945, the British and Americans were lining up on Germany's western border. The Red Army was heading into East Germany. And the three Allied warlords were preparing to converge on Yalta in the Crimea for their second face-to-face -face meeting. Their agenda, the future of the world. Stalin had refused to travel outside the Soviet Union, subjecting Roosevelt to a long, exhausting journey. As Daisy Sukli noted in her diary, the last thing the president needed was to be away from home. January 22nd, 1945. The P doesn't relish this trip at all, thinks it will be very wearing, and feels that he will have to be so much on the alert in his conversations with Uncle Joe and WSC. The conversations will last interminably and will involve very complicated questions. On February the 3rd, Roosevelt landed at Saki Airport in the Crimea. Churchill had already arrived and was in the welcoming party, along with his doctor, Charles Moran. February the 3rd, 1945. The president looked old and thin and drawn. He had a cape or shawl over his shoulders and appeared shrunken. He sat looking straight ahead with his mouth open as if he were not taking things in. Everyone was shocked by his appearance and gabbled afterwards. From Saki Airport, it was a seven-hour drive to Yalta, what Churchill called the Riviera of Hades. The opening dinner gave little encouragement of Roosevelt's appetite for the task ahead. 
The British Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, was among the guests. February 4th, 1945. Dinner with Americans. A terrible party, I thought. The President vague and loose and ineffective. Winston, understanding that business was flagging, made desperate efforts and two long speeches to get things going again. Stalin's attitude to small countries struck me as grim, not to say sinister. I was greatly relieved when the whole business was over. But appearances were deceptive. Roosevelt had two key objectives at Yalta. The first, and most immediate, was to secure Russian entry into the war against Japan after Germany's defeat. Roosevelt succeeded by secretly bribing Stalin with offers of Japanese and Chinese territory. The second, and most important, was to agree with Stalin the structure of a post-war United Nations organization, headed by a Security Council. This would be the practical outcome of Roosevelt's vision of the great powers acting as the world's policemen. In this, Roosevelt also won Stalin's agreement. But, whatever the words, the real question was Stalin's actions. Would he now become a protector or an oppressor? The crucible remained Poland, which was now occupied by Russian troops. Roosevelt and Churchill confirmed that a large swathe of Polish territory would be handed to the Soviet Union. In return, Stalin promised free elections in Poland. He told Churchill, The Soviet Union is interested in the creation of a mighty, free and independent Poland. It's a question of honor, because the Russians have committed many sins against the Poles in the past, and the Soviet government wishes to make amends. But Roosevelt privately offered Stalin plenty of license. The United States will never lend its support in any way to any provisional government in Poland that would be inimical to your interests. At the time, Yalta seemed to herald a new era of cooperation. Alexander Cadogan, permanent undersecretary at the British Foreign Office, and the seasoned and skeptical diplomat, noted, I have never known the Russians so easy and accommodating. In particular, Joe has been extremely good. He is a great man and shows up very impressively against the background of the other two aging statesmen. I think the conference has been quite successful. We have got an agreement on Poland which may heal differences for some time at least and assure some degree of independence to the Poles. Roosevelt was sure Yalta had been a success. He told his doctor, Admiral McIntyre. I've got everything I came for and not at too high a price. The one nettlesome problem is Poland. The settlement we have in mind leaves much to be desired. After Yalta, Roosevelt traveled back to America via Egypt. At Alexandria, Churchill gave what would turn out to be his final salute to the president. And he too now thought Stalin would keep his word. He reflected to his colleagues. Poor Neville Chamberlain believed he could trust Hitler. He was wrong. But I don't think I'm wrong about Stalin. Roosevelt, on his arrival home in Washington, told his cabinet, Stalin has something else in his being besides this revolutionist Bolshevist thing. Perhaps it is to do with his early training for the priesthood. I think that something entered into his nature of the way in which a Christian gentleman should behave. Back in Moscow, Stalin was also pleased. It seemed to him his allies had, by nods and winks, accepted his sovereignty over Eastern Europe. 
When his foreign minister, Molotov, expressed a worry that some of the wording in the Yalta agreement could get in Russia's way, Stalin told him, Never mind. We'll do it in our own way later. On March the 1st, Roosevelt reported to the United States Congress on Yalta, admitting for the very first time in public the pain of his disability. I hope that you will pardon me for an unusual posture of sitting down during the presentation of what I want to say, but I know that you will realize that it makes it a lot easier for me in not having to carry about 10 pounds of steel around on the bottom of my legs and also because of the fact that I have just completed a 14,000-mile trip. Roosevelt assured Congress that Yalta heralded a new age of freedom and peace. The same day, Stalin's deputy foreign minister, Vyshinsky, was in Bucharest installing a puppet government for Romania. There was no consultation with the British and Americans as required in the words of the Yalta agreements. But Stalin had not interfered in Greece, where Churchill was using British forces to repress an attempted communist takeover. It was tit for tat. The test remained Poland. There, the reality of Stalin's promises was emerging. The NKVD was rounding up potential opponents in their thousands. There was no sign of the promised free elections. As reports of Soviet oppression filtered out, Churchill was coming under severe criticism in Parliament and within his government for betraying Poland at Yalta. He asked Roosevelt to join him in a protest to Stalin. Roosevelt knew full well how much leeway Stalin had been given at Yalta and told Churchill they must wait. I feel that our personal intervention would best be withheld until every other possibility of bringing the Soviet government into line has been exhausted. Churchill, under mounting political embarrassment, continued to fire cables at Roosevelt. At Yalta, we agree to take the Russian view of the frontier line. Poland has lost her frontier. Is she now to lose her freedom? Roosevelt was getting the same message from Avril Harriman, his ambassador in Moscow. March 21st. We must come clearly to realize that the Soviet program is the establishment of totalitarianism, ending personal liberty and democracy as we know it. On March the 27th, 16 leaders of the Polish underground were invited by Russian commanders in Poland to discuss local arrangements. It was a trick. They were kidnapped by the NKVD. They would later be subject to a show trial in Moscow and sent to the Gulag. Finally, at the end of March, Roosevelt agreed to admonish Stalin about the imposition of his puppet government in Poland. I must make it quite plain to you that any solution which would result in a thinly disguised continuance of the present Warsaw regime would be unacceptable. But Roosevelt still believed that he could persuade Stalin to fall in line. Having understood each other so well at Yalta, I am convinced that the three of us can and will clear away any obstacles which have developed since then. Some doubts were pricking Roosevelt's natural optimism. He told one of his staff, We've taken a great risk here, an enormous risk. I'm worried. I still think Stalin will be out of his mind if he doesn't cooperate. But maybe he's not going to. In which case, we're going to have to take a different view. Despite his worries, Neither Roosevelt nor his military chiefs in Europe would do anything to thwart Stalin's land grab. On March the 30th, the Allied Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, sent a signal to Stalin 
without consulting his British allies, saying that he was concentrating his forces on southern Germany rather than Berlin. Stalin could hardly believe his luck. The next day, April the 1st, he signaled back to Eisenhower. Your plans completely coincide with the plans of the Red Army. Berlin has lost its former strategic importance. Stalin instantly summoned his two marshals, Zhukov and Konyev, and demanded of them. Who is going to take Berlin? Are we or the Allies? Zhukov and Konyev began a race to Berlin. Roosevelt had gone to Warm Springs, his retreat in Georgia, to rest. His peace was now interrupted by the only unpleasant row in his entire relationship with Stalin. The German commander in the south, General Kesselring, had put out feelers to the British and Americans to negotiate a surrender. Stalin smelt conspiracy. He made the lethal and false accusation that the British and Americans were doing a secret deal to free the Nazis to fight against Russia. Roosevelt was so annoyed that for the very first time he allowed his staff to send in his name angry words to the Soviet leader. Frankly, I cannot avoid a feeling of bitter resentment toward your informers, whoever they are, for such vile misrepresentations of my actions or those of my trusted subordinates. Roosevelt. Stalin quickly saw his mistake in angering the man who had given him so much. He wrote to Roosevelt. I have never doubted your integrity or trustworthiness, just as I have never questioned the integrity or trustworthiness of Mr. Churchill. Once again, Roosevelt could believe that Stalin would always respond to his appeals. On April the 11th, in a message he wrote himself, he told Churchill, I would minimize the general Soviet problem as much as possible, because these problems in one form or another seem to arise every day, and most of them straighten out. We must be firm, however, and our course thus far is correct. It was the authentic voice of Roosevelt, keeping his options open, but above all, seeking to avoid confrontation with Stalin. The next day, April the 12th, 1945, would shatter the world. April the 12th, 1945, Warm Springs, Georgia. Daisy Sukli's diary. Another beautiful day with the promised heat. F woke up with a slight headache and a stiff neck, which probably comes from being overtired. The pouch from Washington won't arrive until after 11. At the moment, everything is peaceful. As the sun hovered over Warm Springs, it was setting over Berlin. That evening, as the fighting grew ever nearer and Hitler faced his final days in the bunker, the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra gave its last wartime performance. Beethoven's Violin Concerto, Bruckner's Eighth Symphony, and the finale to Wagner's Gotterdammerung. In Moscow, Stalin was meeting a delegation of Yugoslav communists. He described to one of them, Miloran Gilas, his view of the new superpower world. This war is not as in the past. Whoever occupies a territory also imposes on it his own social system. Everyone imposes his own system as far as his army has the power to do so. It cannot be otherwise. In London, Churchill was given news of a family tragedy. His wife's cousin, Tom Mitford, and a close family friend, Basil Dufferin, had both been killed in action.
at Warm Springs, Roosevelt was having his portrait painted. The artist said he looked so much better. She was pleased she had not started work the day before. I was crocheting on the sofa. About 1 p.m. I glanced up from my work. F seemed to be looking for something, his head forward, his hands fumbling. I went forward and looked into his face. Have you dropped your cigarette? He looked at me with his forehead furrowed in pain and tried to smile. He put his hand up to the back of his head and said, I have a terrific pain in the back of my head. About 3.15, F's breathing became very heavy and labored. I had a distinct feeling that this was the beginning of the end. 25 minutes of four. It was the end. Franklin D. Roosevelt, the hope of the world, is dead. Roosevelt's death left his duel with Stalin unfinished. In the final days of his life, he realized that his great gamble with the Soviet leader might be failing. But he had by no means given up on it and was not yet ready to confront him. Daisy Sukli summed it up in her diary a few days later. Franklin himself did not have too much faith in Stalin. But he thought that he and Stalin looked at things in the same practical way. And for that reason, there was much hope that Stalin would follow along. On April the 25th, Russian and American soldiers linked up on the River Elbe. The scenes of mutual celebration seemed to herald a new world of cooperation for which Roosevelt had been willing to give so much. But these images were deceptive. In the coming months and years, Stalin would isolate the nations he'd occupied in Eastern Europe from the capitalist West and build a totalitarian empire. Some believe that, had Roosevelt lived, he might have moderated Stalin's actions. But while Stalin made gestures and promises for Roosevelt, he always did what he wanted. Roosevelt's flaw was in believing Stalin was at heart a politician like himself, albeit a harsh one. What he never understood, or chose not to understand, was the reality of Stalin. The combination, equaled only by Hitler, of cruelty, paranoia, ideology, and greed for power. In July 1945, the victors gathered at Potsdam just outside Berlin. Roosevelt was dead. Hitler had shot himself. Churchill was about to be voted out of office by the British people. One man stood triumphant, Stalin, the new emperor of Russia and half of Europe. How different it was from those scenes of Hitler's triumph in Berlin in the same month of July, five years before. They closed one chapter in world history, the age of European empires. Stalin's triumph opened another, the age of two ideologically opposed superpowers and the Cold War which would last nearly half a century. On one level, the outcome had been decided by the march of events and mass armies. But the orchestrators were the four warlords their war of the mind had shaped a new world. 